All right, good morning. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 13 this morning, Luke 13, as we begin another chapter in this remarkable gospel, uh, it's a new chapter, and yet the theme from the prior weeks continues as Jesus teaches us to consider eternity. You know, Jesus first instructed on not being hypocritical in our behavior, greedy in our actions, or worried about our daily provisions, but taught us to keep a heavenly perspective as we journey through this life. He then told us believers to be waiting, watching, and working as we anticipate his arrival, meaning Jesus is coming back. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> and we are to be ready, which led to last week's passage where Jesus expressed the need for people to get right with God ASAP. He gave the illustration about it being impossible to pay a fine when one is locked away in prison. The analogy was spot on. If, if, if someone was found guilty by the judge and sent to prison, they couldn't earn any income to pay their way out. And since there, there would be no way to pay the debt they owe, the person would be stuck in prison forever, never able to get out. Jesus said, before you stand before the judge and are found guilty, the wise thing to do would be to settle out of court so that you wouldn't face the judge in the first place and then forever be in prison. Spiritually speaking, Jesus tells us to settle out of court before it's too late and we face eternal punishment. And the way to settle the debt is by coming to the one who paid the debt that you owe in full. Jesus, amen? Get right with the Lord ASAP. Jesus expressed the need to decide before it's too late, which is so fitting for today's passage because building upon all this, Jesus communicates to his listeners their need to repent. That's right, repent. I, I know this might not be a word people often use in everyday life conversations, like when you go to work or a grocery store, repent. No, I don't really say that. Or maybe, you know, people even picture a long-haired hippie on a soapbox, right, with a big sign that reads, REPENT, all in caps. Repent before it's too late. Some may think that's a wacky, irrelevant message. Not so. Now, a soapbox example might be a little wacky, but the message is not irrelevant. It's essential for us all. To repent means to turn or change direction. It's the call to turn from your sin and towards God, which is so essential, as we'll see, because Jesus shows us that this present response of repentance, or lack thereof, will be carried into eternity. This morning's section has some really important instruction from our Lord, who's so fascinating, instructs us on repentance in the context of people wondering, why do certain people in this world suffer? Lots of confusion surround that question, even today. And in response to that, Jesus gives us so much to consider. Let's get into the passage, but will you first pray with me? Lord, thank you for your love, and thank you for this time to worship you and, and gather in your house and your presence. What a powerful passage this is, Lord, as we hear, as we read your words. And we just ask, God, that you would show us, Lord, cl clarify things for us. I pray that we lead here, leave here empowered, focused on you, changed, Lord. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll cover the first nine verses this morning, but let's begin by reading the first five. I'm going to warn you, though, it starts off quite uh, abruptly, a little shocking even. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. Luke writes, verse 1, there were present at that season some who told him, told Jesus, about the Ga Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Told you. <laughs> verse 2, and Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they, that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? He says in verse 5, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Let's stop right there. And as you notice, besides the graphic descriptions of death, Jesus expresses the seriousness of people's need to repent. I mean, you can't get any clearer. Twice Jesus says, unless you repent, you will perish. But the whole encounter does begin when a group comes before Jesus and tells of a shocking incident that happened with Pilate. Now, most here are familiar with Pontius Pilate, correct? The Roman uh, prefect, think governor, over Judea. Yes, this is the one who ultimately issued the order sentencing Jesus to the cross. 
and I don't know how much you know about him, but, but Pilate, he was a bad dude. He was a villain. He was a villain. And it might be tempting to conclude that, he wa- that it wasn't the case, because after Jesus' arrest, he did interact with Jesus and recognized his innocence, seemingly desiring to set Jesus free. But Pilate, he caved. He caved to pressure. And, and he had Jesus scourged and executed, even though he had the authority to free our Lord. Pilate was willing to disregard what was right to selfishly get ahead in life and maintain power. And regarding his relationship with the Jews, also not good. Pilate was insensitive to their beliefs, had strict, strict policies against them, and aimed to destroy their lives. One Bible dictionary I read said, Pilate is remembered in history as a notorious anti-Semite. You know, one instance regarded, uh, recorded greatly showed his disdain and his brutality. Pilate, at one time, he took money from the Jewish temple treasury to build an aqueduct to supply water into Jerusalem. Well, this act led the Jews to, to gather in protest. They were angry. So in response, Pilate had armed Roman soldiers, disguised themselves as Jews, mixed themselves in the crowd, and they were armed so that they'd come up to some Jews and they would stab them. They would, they would slaughter some. I mean, his, his actions were atrocious. His behavior was cruel. And in our passage, we read of a similar vicious assault by Pilate against some Galilean Jews. Look at verse 1 again. He says, There were present at that, sa- at that season some who told him, told Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, we aren't told the full details of what happened, but it was most likely during a yearly Jewish feast, possibly the Passover, a time where people traveled from their home regions to Jerusalem to make sacrifices. Well, something these Galileans did upset Pilate, and like he did at the protest, he retaliated by slaughtering these Galileans in such a way that they were slayed in the same places, same place that animal sacrifices were made. And somehow their, their blood mixed together at that scene. It Pilate was vicious. And a group of people, they come directly to Jesus and say, have you heard about what Jesus has done? It was brutal. But in Jesus' response, interesting, we discover the real reason they're bringing it up to Jesus. Look at verse 2. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? The way Jesus replies reveals the people's true motive in telling Jesus about the incident, which wasn't to get Jesus to, Jesus to say, oh, that Pilate, <laughs> evil, bad dude. You know, he should lose power. We should rebel against him. We should rebel against all of Rome. He, he doesn't do that. That's what many Jews desired, but not these people, at least at this moment. You know, Jesus' response shows that this group was curious about why these Galileans suffered such a fate. And it wasn't because they were such honorable people who cared so deeply about these Galileans and and how they were slain. No, these Jews, probably from Jerusalem, were implying that Galileans deserved it. That they were such terrible sinners, they got what was coming to them. And their graphic death was evidence of God's displeasure with them. This is what they were suggesting, this is what they were assuming, and we know this because of Jesus' reaction. Notice again our Lord's response. Jesus said, verse 2, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Answer, yes. Yes, that's what they were supposing. That's what they thought. If God allowed them to be slaughtered right there in Jerusalem at the time of sacrifices, then they must have deserved it, is what the Jerusalem Jews were thinking. This was their conclusion. And you know what? This was the overwhelming thought of the day. That if something bad happened to someone, if there was suffering or tragedy to any degree, sickness, financial hardship, personal problems, problems with children, it was a direct result of that person's sinfulness. That was the cause of suffering in their minds. And there are both Old Testament and New Testament examples that reveal this type of thinking. With spoiler alert, this is not an absolute conclusion that we're going to make. Actually, it's not a spoiler alert because in the first part of the next verse, Jesus flat out says, I tell you, no, no to great sin always being the cause of suffering. Now, now Jesus wasn't saying sin never brings devastating consequences or judgment. Because, of course, the Bible gives us examples of that. 
Thursday, we studied Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> were the people there judged because of sin? Yes, they were. As I told the group on Thursday night, I asked two of my kids on two separate occasions about why those cities were judged. And they both had the same exact answer. I mean, they first looked like deer with, like, caught in headlights. They were like this when I asked them about Sodom and Gomorrah. And then they both responded with the same answer, that the cities were judged because of bad stuff. That's what they said. Because of sin. You know, the flood judgment was because of bad stuff. Because of sin. There are personal examples as well in the Old Testament. Lot's wife, she was disobedient. She was judged. Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons who offered strange fire. There are many other examples. In the New Testament, I think about the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira. Peter said that they were lying to the Holy Spirit, and right? They went down. Herod Agrippa, the one who had James beheaded, it, we are told the Lord struck him, and he was eaten by worms and died. Yum, right? There can be judgment direct from God because of sin. But there's also scriptural examples where people suffered without doing anything wrong. Of course, the greatest example in the Old Testament has to be Job, right? I have a question. Does the scripture teach that his sin caused all those hor hor horrific things to happen to him? No. Was losing thousands of animals, his ten children, his health, all caused because his sin was greater than others? Now, according to his supportive friends, it was the case. You know, he also had a very cheerful wife who felt the need to encourage Job by saying this. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? I'm so glad my wife has never said that to me. And it's a good thing he was surrounded by such caring, supportive people, right? Not so much. But Job's suffering had nothing to do with sin. It, it was because there was a spiritual chess match taking place behind the scenes between God and Satan. Job suffered even though he was described as a man who was blameless and upright and who feared God and shunned evil. Even that he was, quote, the greatest of all the people of the East. Job was, was not perfect, but he was clearly less, not more, sinful than all others. A New Testament example is found in John 9 when, when Jesus comes across a man who had been blind from birth. The disciples asked Jesus this. They said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Same thought as the Jerusalem Jews and Job's friends. But Jesus replied there, he says, neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. No sin. And then Jesus would shortly heal this man. Again, Jesus didn't say sin is never the reason, but he does show us that it's not always the reason that people suffer. And he blatantly says, so to the people who come before him, and suppose that the Galileans' suffering was because their sin was greater than others. You know, one author noted that this was a way people looked at their lives as more spiritual than others. S since others were going through things worse than them, they thought they were morally superior. And I just have to say, church, we need to guard against all this type of thinking. Because we can be tempted to do the same thing. You know, even when, when we see someone go through a hardship, we need to resist looking over at them and thinking, they caused it. They brought this upon themselves. Could they have? Maybe. But without all the facts, it's not fair to come to that conclusion. Now, if, if we see someone heading towards a path of destruction, should we warn them? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that is the loving thing to do. If we see someone going, heading down, living a life of sin, we should tell them. You need to, you, you, we should warn them, alert them of what they're doing. But we cannot sit on the sidelines without any information and in our own arrogance go, they are going through this because they deserve it. Th their sin is greater than others, so they deserve it. They deserve what they're going through. It is not fair to do that. It is not right to do that. And Jesus shows us we are not supposed to do that. Look at verse 2 again. It says, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He says, verse 4, Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Notice it's, it's Jesus, not this group, that brings up a second example. 
And the example Jesus uses doesn't have like a fired up pagan ruler conspiring an attack. It is an unplanned, tragic incident that occurs where 18 people are killed when a tower falls and crushes them. And, and you know, looking at that, it's not hard to think of natural disasters and the catastrophic events that take people's lives. Jesus similar, similarly asked them, did this happen because these people were more sinful than all other people that were living in Jerusalem? And that's why they died, because they're more sinful. The answer, like the first, it demands a no. But sometimes it is tempting for us to react yes. That tragedy happened to the life because they deserve it, because they're more sinful. I remember years and years ago, right after like this enormous tsunami devastated a distant country, I was in a prayer meeting of all places, and someone was adamant that God was bringing judgment upon them because the, the country was primarily made up of non-believers. And I have to tell you, it kind of shocked me then, and it still bothers me to this day. <laughs> It bothers me that people can so quickly come to the conclusion with no hesitation that God took them out because of their sinful practices. And I'm sure you've heard it. You've heard things like that when, when, when uh, uh, catastrophic things happen, like whether it's a fire, whether it's a hurricane, tornadoes, storms, earthquakes where people die. You know, even there's something that happened a couple of years ago. What was that thing that happened? I, oh, yeah, COVID, right? <laughs> no COVID. And I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that God can't have his hand of judgment in those things. And when we arrive to heaven, we'll, we'll, go, we'll know. And we'll go, okay, okay, that's what you were doing. That, that's what happened. But to be adamant, to adamantly conclude it now is not good. It's not what we're supposed to do. Especially with what we read in Scripture about God's heart to save. I mean, I think of 2 Peter 3, 9, where we read... The Lord is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We, we often conclude that God is ready to pounce on every sinner, especially those that we deem the worst. But God's Word teaches us that He is desiring to draw people to Himself, that He wants to save people. Personally, I'm even like, what about like, mankind's ultimate foe like what about satan you know scripture talks about how he wants to devour lives you know we briefly touched on how what he did to job i mean how come satan how come the prince of the power of the air he doesn't the hater of all humanity how come he doesn't get more credit he, he deserves a lot of credits i mean, i don't know if you ever do this but how many you listen to unbelievers and if something bad happens a tragedy happens they'll they'll conclude you know what that means that means that there's no god there cannot be a god because if there was a god a loving god he would not allow this tragic to happen. This tragedy to happen. That's what, people, that's what they say. And I'm like, well, what, there's a real enemy. There's a real enemy who wants to destroy people's lives. He's good at it. That's what he does. Also, talking about sin, we live in a fallen world. Because of sin, there is death. Because of sin, there is evil in this world. And sometimes we need to come to that conclusion. But also what Jesus explained 2,000 years ago still rings true today. That not all tragedy and suffering comes upon those because they're the most sinful. And you know, I am so great. I am grateful for Jesus' words because it means, it means this. We don't have the right, we don't have the right to dogmatically make assumptions about people's hardships. We don't. Amen? Amen, <laughs> okay. And yet it's so interesting. It's so interesting. I love this passage. I love it. It's so interesting. So interesting. Jesus, his point in this whole conversation, it isn't to give us a list of why there is suffering in this world. It isn't. And more specifically, the reasons that the Galileans or the 18 struck by the tower died. Do you notice Jesus doesn't tell us exactly the reason why? He knows, but he doesn't tell us. Why? Because there's, there's a greater thing he needs to explain to us. Much greater importance. The much greater importance is Jesus uses those devastations to show the people that they have a need to get right with God before their time on earth expires. That instead of looking at others and going, that's why they're suffering, that's why they're going through it, that's why they're being judged. Instead of doing that, Jesus is instructing them and us that when we see and hear about life-ending tragedies, what we need to do is we need to make an internal examination 
to make sure that we are prepared for eternity. Which is why, after each example, Jesus, in verse 3 and 5, repeats the same exact phrase. He says, I tell you no. It's, sin, it's greater sin, the reason. He says, I tell you no. He says this, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. See, it's not a matter of who has the most sin and therefore will face the most trouble here. Jesus is showing us, he's showing us that all people are already in trouble. <laughs> all people are guilty of sin. I did an extensive study of all. Do you know what all means? All means all. Jesus is saying that all people are set on a course that leads to eternal punishment, eternal judgment. And unless we grab hold of God's gracious hope of forgiveness of sin and eternal life found through his son and his son alone, then we will perish. Do you ever look in the mirror and go, I am slowly perishing. <laughs> am I the only one? I mean, you guys look fantastic, by the way. But, uh, but you know, whether it's by old age or, or, or an incident that occurs that takes our life before old age, we need to realize life here is not going to go on forever. But you know what? Life, it will continue in eternity. And where we will be depends on what we do with Jesus. You know it, right? You know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's an amazing verse, right? Can I get an amen to that? So we love that verse. We memorize that verse. We hold that verse. And I, what, it's incredible. I always like to just look at little parts of this verse because it's like you could break down this verse for like years and it's like a lot of people understand like the, the depth of it. It's like even like for God, meditate on that for a while. For God so loved, think of his love, the world sinful humanity. I mean, you could break this down. He gave his only begotten son. You break it down. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I love, every time I look at this verse, it's like I get something new. And this time, in studying this passage, what jumped out to me is that the opposite of perishing is everlasting life. The opposite of everlasting life is perishing. This is huge. You know, a lot of times when we think of perishing, maybe we think of like annihilation, obliteration. We think, gone, gone forever. And people think that, that that's the end. You'll, you're, you'll hear things like, you know, when, when I die, I'll just be gone. <laughs> My body will become compost, and then I will just fade away into nothingness. That's what I believe anyway, so that's what's going to happen. People can believe that all they want, but that's not what the Bible teaches in fact, though the definition of perish can mean to completely be completely destroyed and abolished, the term also carries the idea of being deprived and lost. And that will be forever. It even, <laughs> it even can be defined to lose. To lose. Let me just say this. You don't want to lose in the way in, the, in this way, because the Bible describes eternity outside of Jesus as total separation from his presence, from God's presence. Outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 20 talks about a final judgment where all who are not found in the book of life, whose lives do not belong to Jesus, will be cast into the lake of fire. The place where Satan and his fallen angels will be cast forever. You're like, what a day to come to church. <laughs> Some of you are like, I thought I was going to sing some happy songs, I was going to see some smiling faces, have a cup of coffee, a donut, check that box after like a good feeling message, three points to pure happiness, right? What did I get, three points? Like slayed Galileans, you know, people crushed by a tower, and now this, yikes. Let me say, welcome to church, welcome to church. But what did we cover earlier? If you saw someone heading towards a path of destruction, would you tell them? Jesus says all people are heading towards destruction and need to be warned. But I have to say there's something so amazing. There's something so incredible, so beautiful in this. And that is there is a way to escape judgment, to be promised everlasting life in heaven where there is fullness of joy and pleasures by God's right hand forevermore. You know, hell was made for Satan and his angels. Heaven was made for people. Heaven was made for you. 
And all that needs to be done, check this out, all that needs to be done has already been done. <laughs> the, debt has, the debt has already been paid. The wrath of judgment already endured by Jesus. You just need to believe in him. Acknowledge you are a sinner in need of a savior. Turn towards him and you will be saved. Can someone say hallelujah to that? Which brings us to the, our word of the day, or the word for our lives, really. Repentance which doesn't only mean to have remorseful feelings, you know? Like, like when you get caught some, doing something wrong and you say sorry, even though you don't make a change, even though you keep doing the same thing. Kids are really good at that. Not my kids, your kids are really good at that. And if they get caught, you know, they, they might cry and say, I'll never do it again. What happens? They do it again, don't they? But it's not, repentance is not only an emotional response. It's a willingness to change. You know, I, I like this one practical description I came across in studying. One author wrote, he said, Repentance begins with a change of the mind, but not in the contemporary sense of changing one's mind, only to change it again. <laughs> it is a change of mind that brings a change of action. Actions. He goes on to say, Repentance is a, is a real turnaround of one's life in respect to sinful conduct. It's agreeing with God's word. And if things in our life go against what God's word instructs, then we are to not make excuses. We are not to justify our behavior. We're to get it out of our lives. And I believe with my whole heart that we can trust that God, he will give us the strength to do it. If he's calling us to change, then he will empower us to change. Will we still make mistakes? Yes, we will still make mistakes. We will fall short of God's glory daily, which means we continue to repent. But God will empower us. He will empower our lives. And regarding salvation, we have to agree with what God's word says. And God's word says we need to repent. That we need to acknowledge our sin and our need for a savior. And it's that, that turning away from our sin and towards him. And let me say this as well. You know, true repentance is not, it's not looking at others and going, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. At least I'm not as bad as them. I'm doing okay because I'm looking at them. They're much worse than me. That's not repentance. Repentance is seeing the Lord, his standard, and knowing that we fall short of his glory, that we need a savior. And I think one of the best pictures of this is the prophet Isaiah. You know, I, I believe at first, he kind of did the same thing that these Jerusalem Jews and, and Job's friends were doing. To, to a degree, he's called, he's a believer. But, but he thought he was just fine and dandy. Others much worse. And in Isaiah chapter 5, what Isaiah was doing, it was he was pronouncing judgment. He was pronouncing judgment. He was going around saying, woe to the drunkard. You know, woe to those who call evil good. Good evil. Wo woe to those who are wise in their own sight. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's what he was doing. But in the very next chapter, he gets a vision of the Lord seated on the throne. The train of his robe filling the temple with glory angelic beings saying, holy, holy, holy. And in that instant, that one finger pointing at others, and he noticed that there were three pointing right back at him. And what he said was, no, whoa, 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 whoa. He said, woe is me. He says, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. What happened with Isaiah is Isaiah saw the standard he saw majesty. He saw how far he was from that, how far he fell short. And he knew the only answer was to humble himself before the Lord. And that's what he did. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe I, Isaiah's response to the Lord in humility and complete brokenness is one of the most beautiful pictures of repentance. And to conclude this section on repentance, Jesus closes with his own illustration. Look at verses 6 through 9. It says this, Jesus, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look for three years. I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none, and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. This is a parable, and, and sometimes 
Parables, I, I think, are, are more uh, like a general point. Some people want to look at every little detail of it, and, and there's, you could do that. But I think this is, there's a, a general thing taking place here. And, and many Bible commentators, they see this directly relate to the nation of Israel. And I believe that's, that's fully true. Israel at this time, uh, at, at, the, at times, is symbolized as a fig tree. And we can easily see how this can relate to them and the reality of their situation. Where Jesus came into the world, he came into the world to first receive his own. And yet his own would not receive him, John chapter 1, verse 11. I mean, even the three years kind of speaks. Three years, how long was Jesus ministering? Three, year, three years, his earthly ministry took place in Israel for that time, and he was longing to see fruit, the fruit of repentance, the nation to turn to him and accept him as Lord and Savior. Some individuals did, but nationally, as a whole, it was not the case. There was even a, an extended period of time for them, for Israel, that even after Jesus was rejected and went to the cross, rose, and would, would later empower his disciples and use them to preach and reach many. Uh, but uh, sometimes there was that time period, but some years later, in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and national Israel was dispersed, was cut down for centuries, only to be reestablished in 1948, which I believe is so prophetic, so prophetic. But I also believe it, it shows us visibly what Scripture teaches about God's heart for Israel, that he loves Israel, <laughs> that he's not done with them. There is, and there is for sure that application of the parable, but, but there's also a personal application, like we were talking about in our passage. And that is, guys, God is patient. He is so patient and long-suffering, right? Second Peter 3, 9. He is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is his heart. But the truth of the matter is, he is not going to wait forever. We have to make a choice whether we're going to turn to him or not. And we, we only have our time here to make that decision. How long does each person have? Only God knows, right? We can't go, well, I'm not that old. You know, I, I, have, I have plenty of time left. I'll deal with all that stuff of eternity later. Remember what happened in the parable of the rich fool? Who, said, who had so many crops, he didn't know what to do with them. I have so much. So many people says, what do I do with it? Until he had that moment of realization. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to build huge barns. I'm going to store up all my possessions and say to my soul, soul, you got it made for many years of coming. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. Only to find what? He would die the very night. Tomorrow is not promised. Life is but a vapor. You're here for a little while, and then it vanishes. James would say that. And who knows? Who knows? We might be in the wrong place at the wrong time. A tower may fall. There might be a bad accident. We don't know what is going to happen to our lives. The only thing we know, the only thing we know and can be guaranteed is that something is going to happen. Personally, I'm counting on the rapture. <laughs> I'm anticipating the glorious appearing of my great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what I'm waiting for. That's what I'm longing for. But if he chooses to tarry, then that means I'm going to die. <laughs> you are too. <laughs> Everyone will. The question is, have you turned to Jesus? If so, let me remind you, you get to live with hope and assurance that you will be with him forever in paradise, in a place where there is no injustice. Think about that, no injustice, no corruption, fullness of joys and pleasures as at his right hand forevermore. It's going to be so good that upon arrival, our Lord will take his still scarred hands, embrace us, wipe every tear from our eyes, welcome us in, and there will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. And I know you guys have faced it. You have faced tragedy. Maybe it's in relationships. Maybe it's physical things. Let me say this. It is tough here. It is tough here. It's perfect there. And that's why Paul in Romans 8, 18 would say this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be re revealed to us. 
You know, like the keeper of the vineyard, our, our Lord has it's been patient. He's been patient. He is patient. He's, he's digging. He's digging around. He's fertilizing. He's doing all he can to draw people. But the question is, will there be fruit? Will people turn in repentance? That's the fruit he's looking for. Did you notice that the parable was left open-ended, unresolved? You know, we're not told if the tree bore fruit or not. I think that's important because it personally applies to each one of us. And the question, are we going to bear the fruit of repentance? Are we going to turn to the Lord? Are we going to acknowledge our sin? Are we going to acknowledge that we need a Savior? Tomorrow's not promised. Fifteen minutes from now is not promised. But eternity is promised. Where are you going to be? Depends on what you do with Jesus. Do you belong to him? Have you confessed him as your Lord and Savior? Do you belong to him? You know, like the, the, the prison illustration, the application is to get right with God now. That's what we're to do. Get right with God now. If you've never given your life to Jesus, let today be the day of your salvation. <laughs> Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Turn towards him. Turn away from your sin. And you know what? He'll clean you up. <laughs> the cool thing about God is he works those things out of you. It's not like, okay, I give my life to the Lord, now I have to be perfect. You're still going to fall short. He will work in you. He will clean you up. He will do those things. He will even place new desires in your heart, like coming to church, serving him, glorifying his name. He will do those things. But you've got to turn to him. Acknowledge him as Lord, that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Like Isaiah, man, you can't look at everybody else. Whoa, whoa, it's easy to go, whoa, 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 when you look at everybody else. But when you look at God, you go, woe is me. For I am undone. I'm a man, I'm a woman of unclean lips. I need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. Amen. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for this morning that we could just get into your word, Lord. And it's real. The most important decision in life is not what we do for a career, go to college, even who we marry, important. It's choosing you. It's looking to you. It's acknowledging that we have our need, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. There's one Savior who said of himself, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But all, all of us can rejoice if we come to you because if we come to you, then we have been accepted by the Father and we become children of God. We have the right to become children of God. I pray right now, if someone doesn't know you, Lord, they would open their heart to you, even in this moment, that they would, they would call upon your name. They would look internally as, as they look around this world, see all the, the tragedy, all the catastrophic events happening, but they would analyze what's taking place inside. Do they realize, I gotta get right. I gotta think about eternity they would see you on the throne, see that you are Lord. They are a sinner in need of a Savior. You are that Savior. They would turn to you, confess you as Lord, turn from the, their sin, turn towards you. Acknowledge, Lord Jesus, you came, you died, were buried, rose again the third day, and are alive. We're so grateful, Lord. I, I just thank you that you are the God who saves. <laughs> You're the God who's patient. And I pray, Lord, people will respond to you even now, even as we sing this last song. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Go before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Will you please stand? If you need prayer, if you need to talk about salvation, we'll be up here. The Lord is good. He is faithful. Let's proclaim praises to his name. Amen. God bless you.